How many people saw um, The uh, Passion, the movie by uh, Mel Gibson? A lot of people saw that movie. It's been a while now, a couple of years, but uh, it's been on TV, people are renting it, so on and so forth. And if you saw that film and you read the reviews when it came out at the time, you probably saw and heard how violent it was. Probably one of the only films you know, about Jesus, usually when they make a movie about Jesus, usually G, it's rated G or PG. You know? It's one of the only movies rated R. You know, we, as Christians, we were going to the movies to see an R-rated movie about Jesus. I mean, you know, it was kind of weird. And there's a good reason why it was rated R. It was so violent. I mean, I was cringing. I, was, I remember watching that movie the first time and I was just cringing. I mean, I, I didn't see violent like that in like violent movies. How they just beat and beat and beat and beat and beat on him. You know, I mean, physically and, and psychologically, it was, it was horrible. And of course, there's a good reason for this. Crucifixions were violent and bloody affairs. They were meant to be in order to frighten and in order to terrorize those who witnessed them. And seeing lots of blood, usually, you know, that usually did the trick. If you wanted to really terrorize a nation, have a couple of miles of crosses there with people nailed to them you know, for about a mile along the road, that usually got you know, the local politicians' attention and the people. Now I'm sure Mel Gibson had this in mind when he made his movie, but I wonder if he also realized that the presence of so much blood also had another important significance a significance concerning the essential relationship between mankind and God. You see, whenever I read about the priests and their work in the Old Testament, I am struck by the layers of rules and regulations that prohibited the ordinary person from coming to God. Today, of course, we close our eyes and through prayers, we communicate directly with the Lord of heaven, with the God of the universe, the God who created the universe. But in the Old Testament time, only the priests could come close to God in temple service, and only the high priest could actually be in the presence of God, as it were, once per year to offer the sacrifice of atonement. And not even all the priests could serve. I mean, you had to come from the right family to even have the opportunity to serve God. However, as Leviticus chapter 21 and 22 informs us, even if you had come from the right family, if you had uh, afterwards uh, uh, married a woman who was divorced or someone that was outside of your tribe, you were excluded, you couldn't serve. Or if you had any kind of physical deformity or illness, you had an accident, you lost a finger or a toe, or you had other kinds of physical deformities, a lazy eye or you know, a crooked arm or arthritis, anything like that, you couldn't serve. If you had skin rashes or a broken bone, you couldn't serve. You could not serve as priest or serve in the temple, which was the only way to come near to God. But Mel Gibson's movie and its graphic description of the shedding of Christ's blood brought into focus the idea that it was this blood that changed once and for all the way that I would relate to God and He to me. That blood there that we see in the movie, pretend blood, you know, but that movie representing the blood that was shed, that blood is what made the difference between the way I relate to God and the way that the Old Testament people and the Old Testament priests, how they related to God. The blood of Christ purchased something very valuable for us. 
For example, it purchased for us entry into the most holy place. You know, we went to the movie and when it first came out, you paid full price. You know, there were no discounts. You paid full price to see the movie. The entrance fee, 12 bucks, whatever it was, to get in to see the movie. In the same way, but on a much higher level, the blood of Jesus purchased for us the right to enter into the holy place where God is. In Matthew 27, 51, Matthew tells us that after Jesus shed His blood and died on the cross, it said the veil of the temple was torn in two. Now the veil was a thick embroidered veil that hung between the holy place and the, holies, the holy of holies inside the temple. Two rooms, basically. This drape here separated these two rooms. And as I mentioned, only the priests could go into the holy place to perform their daily ministries. However, beyond the veil, in the holy of holies, this place, this you know, area here, it could only be entered once a year by the high priest. When this veil was miraculously torn in two at Jesus' death, it signified several important things for us. For example, it signified the fact that the ministry of the priests as the mediators between God and His people was over. It was done. From now on, there was to be no closing off of the holiest place where God was it would be accessible to all. Through the blood of Christ, His disciples would be purified so as to allow them to go into the presence of God. In Hebrews chapter 9, verses 1 to 14, the writer explains that the Holy of Holies and its furnishings represented the, th the true Holy of Holies in heaven. And with His blood sacrifice, Jesus had entered into that place in heaven. And the purpose was to open a way for us to also enter into that place. The author summarizes this idea in chapter 10 when he says, Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which He inaugurated for us, through the veil that is His flesh. In other words, His flesh, His blood. His blood parted the curtains and allowed everyone, everyone who believed in Him to enter into that place, to the real place. Not just the place where the priests went, a replica of the Holy of Holies, that's not the place where we're allowed to go in that room. The writer of Hebrews said, no, 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 no. The blood of Jesus purchased us for us the right to enter into the real holy place up in heaven. This means that there are no longer restrictions for believers to enter into God's presence. No physical restrictions, no moral or social restrictions. And not only are we not restricted by our various imperfections, but we get to enter into the very presence of God, not just His symbolic presence as the Old Testament priests used to do. We get the real deal. They only went to the symbol. Now because Jesus shed His blood, every sinner, Every weak and ill, every widow and divorcee, every man, every woman, regardless of race or background, can come into the presence of Almighty God and make their requests known to Him in person. His blood buys us entry into the divine throne room that was denied for so long to so many. Another thing that the blood of Jesus buys that we might not think of, it buys for us the right to minister. In the Old Testament I mentioned that only a certain tribe, the Levites, could serve at the temple. To try to do so without being a member of that group would cost you your life.
And those who would actually offer sacrifice had to come from a certain family, as I mentioned, within that tribe. Of course, if there were any kinds of imperfections, even those people were disqualified from service. But now through the blood of Christ, all kinds of people are made worthy to follow and to minister in the name of Jesus Christ. Paul mentions the background of some of these people who are ministering to Jesus in 1 Corinthians. Listen now, listen to the pedigree. Listen to the qualifications of these people. He says, do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Here's the, here's the uh, sweet spot in that passage. Such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, this is now the pedigree of most of those who will serve in the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, who did he mention? The rich, the famous, the well-educated? No, uh, the revilers, the drunkards, the adulterers the effeminate, the sexually impure, the thieves. These are the guys that are going to be serving in the kingdom. These were some of you. Certainly some of these words describe me. And here I am and here you are. Paul was extremely sensitive to this idea because as one who was guilty of persecuting and killing Christians before his conversion, he felt especially unworthy to serve the Lord. However, in 1 Corinthians 15, 9 and 10, he declares the wonderful reason why he's been given this magnificent opportunity to minister. He says, I am the least of all the apostles and am not fit to be called an apostle because I, am pers I persecuted the church of God. But he says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, every man that comes up here to pray, to lead, to teach, to preach, to, to do the communion, can say exactly the same thing. By the grace of God, I am what I am and I have a right to stand here and minister to the church. And every woman that brings a dinner and every woman that teaches a child and every woman that serves can say, I am what I am. I'm allowed to serve. I'm allowed to do something for Christ. Why? Because of the grace of God. That's why. Cowards, murderers, prostitutes, as well as simple people like fishermen and seamstresses and slaves, all were made worthy to serve the living God in a more dynamic and effective way than even the priests and their elaborate ceremonies of the Old Testament ever did. And why? All because of the blood of Christ. In the Old Testament, only a few were selected and purified to render a limited service to a symbolic imagery of, of God. Now everyone purified by the blood of Christ can serve the living God every single day without reservation. Education and training provides you with skills in ministry, but it's the blood of Christ that buys you the all important right to serve the living God of heaven. A guy with a college degree in religion can call himself a minister, but without the blood of Christ, he isn't God's minister. And then, as we're you know, talking through the blood of Christ, what does it do for me, for you? It buys us entry into the presence of God. It purchases for us the right to minister and it also purchases for us the most important personal thing that we have, and that is peace of mind. Peace of mind. In several places in the world, you know, the United States is trying to arrive at some kind of peace. In some places it does it through military means to try to 
arrive at some peace through military means, in other places through diplomacy, in other places through economic pressure, and so on and so forth. But the blood of Christ works in a different way. It has paid the price for peace in various areas that enable us to have peace. First of all, it has paid the price so that we can have peace with God. In other words, peace between God and man. When Paul says that Jesus, having made peace through the blood of His cross in Colossians 1.20, when he says that, he's talking about the conflict between God and man due to man's sins. Each person violates God's commands in one way or another and brings judgment and punishment upon himself. We, we know that. And because of that, there is no peace between an angry God and a guilty sinner, no peace. But Jesus' sacrifice makes atonement for all of these sins and restores a peaceful and non-judgmental relationship between God and sinful man. I'm going to repeat that. Listen to it. The blood of Jesus Christ restores a non-judgmental relationship between God and sinful man. The key word, a non-judgmental. You think that's easy to have, a non-judgmental relationship? It's nearly impossible. Every relationship that we have with other human beings has an element of judgment in it. I don't like her hair. His voice bothers me. He talks too loud. She thinks she's better than me. I mean, right? Isn't that it? Isn't that the way it works? The blood, I'll say it one more time. The blood of Christ purchases a non-judgmental relationship between me and God. I can deal with the fact that I may have a relationship that has some judgment in them between you and me. I can deal with that. I can sleep at night, even if you judge me, but I sleep a whole lot better at night knowing that God does not judge me. And that kind of peace of mind has been purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. Paul explains this in Romans chapter 5, 1, when he says, therefore, being justified by faith, that is, confidence that Jesus' blood takes away our sin, that's what Paul is talking about, we have peace with God. Peace with oneself, a sense of peace and security in general is not possible unless a person is at peace with God, our Lord and our Savior. The blood of Jesus Christ secures that peace with Almighty God once and for all. People wonder, you know, what's the joy that happens when the people come out of the waters of baptism? They're so happy and they hug and I'm so happy. Why are you so happy? And I, I've asked people that, why are you happy now? And it comes out in different forms. And I say, well, I, I'm going to heaven. Or they say, well, I, I just, I, I, God's forgiven me. Or, God's not mad at me anymore. Uh-huh, that's right, you got it. Try to remember that for the next 50 years. Try to keep that in mind as you go forward from here on in, because it seems that preachers have to remind everybody of this idea. And the blood of Jesus also, also purchases the peace also between men, or mankind if you wish, all those who are at peace with God can now be at peace with their neighbors, whoever they are. The blood of Christ brings together all people into a fellowship of grace and forgiveness that supersedes all the barriers of race and ideology. Paul describes this joining of separate cultures under Christ in this way. He says, <coughs> excuse me, in Ephesians 2, but now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. What's he talking about? This verse refers to the joining of the Jews and the Greeks in Christ. 
No two cultures could be more different in history and language and custom than the Jews and the Greeks in the first century. And yet, it was these very groups who were brought together by their common belief in Jesus Christ. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> it wasn't simply a question of a shared set of religious customs but rather an understanding that despite their outward differences, inwardly they were all sinners needing the blood of Christ to, to, to bring them to God and make them worthy to serve and guarantee their perfection from sin. Listen, uh, <coughs> I don't have a lot of things in common you know, with, uh, with Bill Farmer. I'm a very, very young man and he's a little older than me. But I mean, you know, he was in the military and he was in the war and he traveled all over the world and, you know, and so on and so forth. I had none of those experiences. We're so different, so very different. I didn't even speak his language when I was a little boy. What's the only thing that, that really brings us together? Well, he believes in Jesus and I believe in Jesus. And the blood of Christ wiped away his sins and the blood of Christ wiped away my sins. End of story. That's all I need to know. Those of you who travel to other countries and go visit the church in other countries, that's when that idea really comes home. People are dressed different than you. They don't look like you. They don't talk like you. Everything is different. And yet when you begin to talk about the Lord and share, it's like you're at home. The blood of Jesus not only unites disparate groups under the Lordship of Christ, but it also moves those within this fellowship to treat the rest of the unbelieving world with compassion and offer of salvation. Whether united by His blood or reaching out to proclaim His blood or persecuted because of His blood, those who have come under the power of the blood of Christ they have peace within themselves and they pursue peace outside of themselves. And so, <coughs> I'm sorry. <clears throat> the next time you take communion and you're thinking or praying after drinking the little bit of fruit of the vine that you're served, remember that it represents the blood of Christ shed expressly for you and realize that without this blood, your prayers to God would not be heard, and your service to God would not be acceptable, and your sins would not be forgiven, and your heart would never be at peace. And so my encouragement to you tonight is twofold. First of all, when you do take communion, be thankful. If you're looking for the emotion, sometimes people are thinking, what should I be feeling? Yeah, gratitude. Go for gratitude, you'll be safe there. It's the one time during the week where you can truly focus on the heart and soul of your faith and appreciate the reason why you have what you have. Be sure you make the effort to take communion every Sunday and have a thankful and reverent heart when you do, and I know that a lot of people are here tonight because for whatever reason they, they weren't able to be at services this morning. And the main reason is what? Well, they, they've come because they want to have the fellowship of the saints and certainly to hear a word of encouragement, but they want to take the communion. Very, very important. And then my second encouragement for you to consider in reference to the blood of Christ is this. Don't kid yourself, please. Don't kid yourself. Don't fool yourself into thinking that you can serve God or please God or have peace with God without the blood of Christ. The blood of Jesus is the only way to come to Almighty God. There is no other way. A young lady this morning, I was, I was up in uh, Ponca City and I was preaching there this morning, a young lady came up to me after and she wondered, you know, <coughs> she wondered about who was saved and who wasn't saved, you know, and she, she had a lot of questions about those type of things. What about, you know, Chinese people in the fourth century and that, that type of thing. 
I hope she's listening to this sermon tonight. Because the answer to that question and all those questions is, without the blood of Christ there is no salvation. Paul tells us we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, Ephesians 1.7. Peter says that we must obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled by His blood, 1 Peter chapter 1 and 2. And so I encourage you, don't, don't put off obeying Jesus and washing away your sins in His blood by being baptized in His name, just as Paul did when Ananias said to him, why do you delay, get up, be baptized, and wash away your sins, calling on His name, Acts chapter 22, verse 16. So the invitation is simple, logical tonight. Do you need the blood of Jesus Christ? The blood of Christ to wash away your sins in the waters of baptism. The blood of Jesus Christ to continue wash away your sins as you confess sin and are restored to Him. If you have a need for the blood of Christ, the need for ministry of any kind that we have a right to give you because of that blood, then we encourage you to come forward now.